Well, let's see. It's it's what? It's eight o'clock, almost nine o'clock there for you all. Uh, yeah, ten to nine. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Ten to ten to nine. You can well, prove I can prove that it's late at night because I've got I've got my slippers on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, you guys are also drinking. I'm it's only almost it's only almost four o'clock here, so I'm still on the water train. So yeah, yeah well, just water for mind, me. I'm gonna pour myself uh, something now. This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Art Eatables, the world's first bourbon-certified chocolatier and creator of the Small Batch Bourbon Truffle. These aren't your grandma's bourbon balls. Shop through two locations in downtown Louisville or online at arteatables.com. Use offer code PURSUIT to save 5% on your in-store and online orders. If you want the perfect button-down shirt that fits right and doesn't look cheap, then you need to visit Leadberry. Leadberry offers high-quality apparel with easy returns and top-notch customer service. Visit leadberry.com slash bourbon, L-E-D-B-U-R-Y dot com slash bourbon, and use coupon code bourbon at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Hey everyone, we're back again this week with another great episode talking about the bourbon boom, but this time it's with a twist. It's going to look at the market from the perspective of living abroad over in England, so this can be great for all those international listeners out there. There's still time for you to buy your Bourbon Pursuit t-shirt, koozie, and stickers, all for $35 and have it in time before Christmas. We are sold out of men's double XL as well as large and only a few more sizes of men's and women's are remaining so reach out to us either on social media or send us an email to the duo t-h-e-d-u-o at bourbonpursuit.com to purchase i also want to say thank you to everyone who has filled out the bourbon pursuit audience survey again this is going to go a long way in helping us grow the show by knowing our audience more Remember, we're also giving away a $50 Amazon gift card to one lucky winner, so please take the three minutes to fill it out at bourbonpursuit.com survey. We are up to 136 iTunes reviews, and I'm always floored when I read the comments because it really makes us know our listeners care. This week's shout out goes to Voiman, V-O-I-M-A-N-E-N, who says, if you're new to bourbon or a longtime drinker from when you could find Pappy Van Winkle on the shelf, if you aren't listening to Bourbon Pursuit, then you're missing out. You are going to learn something new every episode. Download, listen, and subscribe now. Thank you to everyone else for all your great reviews. It really does go a long way in helping promote our brand and get this podcast in front of more bourbon lovers out there. With that, enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon, the number one podcast of bourbon that you can find on iTunes today. Kenny here today. We are riding solo again. Ryan can't join us, but this is this is a cool show because we're finally going international. We have we have a great audience. You know, for our longest time, we have uh, we've had all kinds of people that send us emails saying, you know, like hello from Denmark or hello from Sweden, all these different places, and it's been awesome to kind of get that that fan base and kind of understand what's going. And then back in August, we put out a a message to our Facebook followers and our Facebook fans. And it said, you know, what, what are some of those topics that you all care about? Like, what do you want to know? And then uh, I got this email from these two guys that we have on today. And it was kind of funny because I think it, it could have been sparked from a past episode we had on with Ed Bly talking about how just kind of crazy that retail pricing and markets have gotten in the U S and these guys said, uh, you don't even know the half of it yet. This is, you don't even know what happens here in the UK. So this is, uh, this is where we get to hear that side of it today. We kind of get to see about, you know, what's going on uh, with the bourbon market, you know, outside of what we see in our, in our, in, with inside the United States, right? We kind of see how it's, how it's flourishing around there. We can see, uh, you know, how easy it is to get bottles, whether the, they're just swimming in BTAC or they can, if they have to just, you know, do it, do the hard way. Like we all have to as well. So today uh, we have on the show today, we have two gentlemen that are original founding members of the British bourbon society. We have Ed Rosie and Andrew Watson. So fellas, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. 
Absolutely. So, uh, Ed, I'll, I'll ask you first, man. So, kind of talk about your journey into bourbon and kind of how you got into this. I've just got to say quickly, there are there's a few of us who started this group, and there are two Eds, yeah. and there are two Andrews. No, no, sorry, there are three Eds, two Andrews, and a Chris. So, when you were <laughs> when you were referring to the other Ed at the beginning, you were probably talking about um, Ed Taylor. But yeah, just just so you know, there's a, there's a, there's quite a few of us. <laughs> it sounds good. So let's hear your story, man. My my journey into bourbon, I think um I think it probably started with my my dad as a Scot. So I was already I was always quite interested in whiskey from, you know, the Scotch side of things. And I think I always had this kind of romantic idea of getting into collecting it in some way, but never really knew enough about it. Um and then I think it happened. I think I stumbled upon bourbon because in a TV program, like a breakfast, was it a breakfast program? It was like a cooking program or something. It was on uh, on a Sunday morning a few years ago. And they were talking about uh, Whistle Pig 111. And I think the comment that the lady made, which actually this we, we, this lady that, we, that made the comment has actually turned out to be a bit of a friend of the British Bourbon Society, but she... She said something along the lines of, if you buy a bottle of this now, in a few years' time, you'll be able to sell it and uh, buy yourself a house. So I was immediately like taken back by that comment. I thought, like, that sounds mental. Anyway, so I bought one uh, kind of on a whim. I mean, I liked bourbon, but I didn't really know anything about it. Um, so I, I bought that bottle. And then obviously what she was saying was a complete exaggeration. But long story short, the obsession just kind of, took over then and I had this kind of want to kind of hunt bottles and find new stuff uh, and then I started doing a bit of blogging on Instagram and then met a few of these guys I met Andrew met uh, the other Ed and that was kind of the beginning of what ended up happening online which was how it was all formed which Andrew could probably talk to you about in more detail but yeah that was it it was kind of my dad being being a Scot introducing me to Scotch loving that and then seeing a TV program, which made me intrigued in bourbon. And then I'm, a, I'm an avid researcher. So I just started doing a crazy amount of reading and all that sort of stuff. And then before I knew it, I had five bottles and then I had 30, then I had 70. And then it's just become a problem. A good problem. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's pretty interesting. I don't think I've ever heard a lot of people that got into bourbon by having that sort of story of saying like, oh, it's a financial you know, thing that say like, this could be worth something one day. I mean, I remember myself, I, I, this is, I mean, these are years ago. I'm talking like 15 years ago. And I remember it was like when Jurassic Park 2 came out and we were in the, we were shopping at the grocery store and there was this limited edition box of Lucky Charms of Jurassic Park. And I was like, I got to have it because one day it's going to be worth something, right? And then, of course, nothing that's not worth anything today. But, I mean, it's kind of funny that you had that uh, that idea that, you know, this could be a financial impact. And then it, you end up, you know, maybe opening a bottle or two and then kind of realizing that, oh, this is actually pretty good stuff. Yeah, it's a funny one because, I'm, I mean, I would make no, you know, there's no secret of it. That was initially what I was interested in. But I think when you start to try lots of good bourbons, whiskeys, whatever wines, it becomes difficult to keep those bottles closed. So I think that, you know, that was initially my, you know, in, intro into it. But, you know, since then I've opened many expensive bottles and I've kept many as well, but I've, you know, I've opened a lot. So um, I think we can talk about that side of things more um, as, as the conversation grows. But yeah, that was how it started, but it's changed quite a lot since then. Real cool. All right. So Andrew, let's hear your side, man. Yeah, mine's a little bit different to that. <laughs> I um, basically got into it through my old man as well. But um, me and him tend to bond through having good drink. And I, I liked scotch before um, I got into bourbon. But he, he was always kind of into bourbon. And he, he, he brought a bottle of Woodford Reserve around my house one time. And this was maybe about five years ago. And me and him put the world to rights drinking this bottle of Woodford Reserve, um, killed it. And then uh, just yeah, the, the next day when my hangover finished, I realised that, hang on, I, this is something I actually really, really enjoy. 
still didn't really know that much about bourbon other than that bottle of Woodford Reserve because my experience prior to that was, you know, Jack Daniels and, you know, I had more memories of it coming out of my mouth and going into my mouth <laughs> being a student. Um, but then, but I was, you know, interested in seeing what else was out there because it's only when someone says, try this, that you really realise that there's a whole world of delicious spirit out there. So I started Googling and I found a website called the, um, the Whiskey Exchange, which is, I mean, they're a global um, website, so you've probably heard of them. Uh, and I found a bo bottle of Blanton's Gold and I was immediately drawn to the shape of the bottle. And obviously, you know that that's something that you can't get in the US. I didn't know that at the time. But it was something that drew me to the bottle and obviously all the reviews were stellar and I bought this bottle and that was my sideways moment because I drank that and from then on I was I was hooked. I wanted to see what else was out there and I think from there I tried Mictors, from there I tried Four Roses and and, then, and that's it and that's just that's just how it grew. So then talk about how the, the British Bourbon Society kind of grew out of this as well. Yeah, so obviously... Ed and myself um, were into bourbon and we were on social media. There's a whole bunch of us in the UK that are um, on social media that were speaking to other guys in the US and, you know, brands, we're talking brands, distillers. But there wasn't a real platform where we could all talk and speak to each other um, you know, in, in, in the UK. So what we did was we, the guys that were based in London, um, which ended up being the six fa uh, founders of the BVS, we decided to meet up one, uh, one evening at a uh, whiskey bar called Milroy's of Soho. And we all met up, had, had a fantastic evening, you know, uh, sharing in our love of bourbon and sharing samples and, yeah, I've just had a fantastic time. And with whiskey comes ideas. And there came the idea of setting up a, um, a Facebook group to try to, you know, so that we could talk with each other, but to try and help entice other people to talk with us in the UK. Because if we're having that problem that we, you know, there's nowhere for us to speak together in the UK, then there must be, there must be others out there. And it's, you know, we proved it to be the case because, you know, within two years, that small Facebook group has grown from us six guys to today around 1,200 members, which has been in part because of uh, the boom in bourbon in general, but also because of the fact that we've put on tasting events, we've done a whole bunch of things that, you know, people want to go to. We essentially what we're trying to do is do things that we want to go to, that isn't available because we, we don't live in Kentucky. You know, we're we're not in the states, so we've got to try to um, put on the kind of stuff that we want to. Uh, we we would like to go to if we lived in Kentucky. So, yeah, I think just, uh, yeah. If, I think your accent kind of gave that one away that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking back to that evening actually, and um, <clears throat> it was quite funny because. I had been talking with uh, Ed Taylor, who who's one of the other founding members. I'd been talking to him maybe a little bit more because we both had Instagram accounts and we were chatting away. Uh, and I ended up, I met him first before we met the rest of the group. And then I had a really good night and we all uh, had drinks and got to know each other and stuff, which was really cool. Uh, and then um, Ed actually had a friend who'd said, oh, there's a, there's a bottle of something pretty special at a, uh, a bar around the corner. Uh, we should go check it out. And I mean, I didn't really know anything about this bottle at the time, but I mean, it turned out to be something pretty special. It turned out to be uh, the Bitter Truth Rye that they had. Oh, nice. um, yeah. for a crazy, I mean, this is part of the benefit. I mean, it was, it's kind of changed a lot now, but at the time, you know, there's this huge wake of popularity with bourbon that's sort of spread across the Atlantic to us. And there was just still some kind of gems hidden around and we managed to... Uh, Get, get some of this bit of truth right. I think how much did we pay for it in the end? It was like, it was uh, like 30, 30 pounds. 30 quid double. It was crazy. Um, so that's um, today's money, $40. $40 for a double. 
And it's just kind of made the whole thing even more serendipitous because we all still talk about it now and are just like, oh my God, can you believe that was the day we all met and we ended up having probably one of the best pours we've ever had. So, <laughs> but what, what, cool. what makes me laugh is that we're talking about $40 for a, for a glass of whiskey being really good value. Yeah, I know. If you speak to anybody else, I think we're crazy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You know, you know, taking that crazy thing, I, I couldn't imagine like what your uh, your wives and significant others were thinking, like saying, like, "Oh, I'm just gonna meet these random guys off the internet. We're just gonna go drink together." Yeah, yeah she's still getting over it now. <laughs> yeah, there's a few raised eyebrows. I'm telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what, well, talk about like we've, talk sorry, about like okay. the last sorry, talk about like the, the last event that you put on. Like, what what kind of does it entail in regards to like the things that you really want to try and you know bring to your audience? So we've we've put on events. We try to do um, events in partnership with some of the brands and uh, distillers. So in particular, I'll, I'll use this time of year as an example. A lot of the distillers are over in the UK for the um, whiskey show, which is the largest whiskey event in the UK, possibly, possibly Europe. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's an enormous event and the U S distillers come over and because we've kind of become, and we've grown into, we've evolved into, I guess the, the you know, the, the number one resource for UK American whiskey, they contact us, um, to put on events with them because we've got the members, we've got the people that actually want to go to these things. And we've had Brent Elliott from Fort Roses. We've had um, John Little from Smooth Ambler. We've had Pam Harmon from uh, Mictors. And, you know, we put on little kind of intimate events, but we make them quite um, professional. Um, Mm. Ed is fantastic in design. He he makes these amazing posters. um, Pressure, man. It's become, kind of become our brand now, hasn't it? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I we it's good actually because we all kind of assume different roles in this and um, uh, Ed and Ed Taylor and Andrew and the other guys kind of do more of the events than I do and I just try and, you know, I work in the creative services anyway so I try and sort of help provide a bit of a kind of brand look and feel to this. So I think we, we try and do nice posters for our events Um uh, and I think the feedback is generally just, you know, it kind of is what sets us apart, I guess. And it's it's just trying to, you know, when it comes to the website and it just the whole look of BBS, it just we want to just try and make it, you know, premium. And I think that's what appeals to brands more. They're more willing to get behind us and to help us, you know, out and collaborate with us when when the shop front looks good. And their admission is only a few bottles of bourbon for the original six, right? That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, we, we, honestly, though, I mean, it's a good point. We, it's worth saying we, we're nonprofit. We don't, you know, a lot of this is hard work on top of our day to day job. So we don't, we, you know what? We don't even get samples sent to us. We complain about this all the time, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it's, it's a fun. job, it's the worst job in the world because we don't pay anything and we actually have to spend a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> that is. Yeah. That is. Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta figure out a better way to monetize that then, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that is really cool. I mean, it, it, that you're able to do that and do something for the community around you, you know, kind of going back when you're talking about this craze a little bit, it's kind of funny. It's almost like, you know, maybe you shouldn't have told so many people about this, then you'd have some more of those epic pours just sitting around the city still. Yeah. Yeah, we've thought about that a lot as well. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've created the beast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, in that go re- back to the the events, if I may, like some of the other events that we've done, distillers aside, we've we've done um, we put we put on a blind tasting of Pappy Van Winkle, which was fantastic. So no distillers there. This was just us. We put on a, a blind tasting of the the full range, and this was at a restaurant that that were happy to host us, and we 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 made a bottle of. Um, poor man's pappy as well and snuck it in and nobody knew what they were tasting and everybody had to mark up which they preferred and give each a, a rating and at the end we tallied the results um pappy 23 one i don't think was too unsurprising because as soon as you hold it up to the light you know it's pappy 23 but what was surprising was how high poor man's pappy scored above some of the others I won't tell you which, but it was it, it beat many of the others. It, this it was, 
I think came third out of the entire range. Yeah, that's awesome. Did, yeah. So that yeah, was quite that was quite funny. Um, other one we've done, we've done um, what I, that I particularly enjoyed was an old versus new. So we bought new uh, old vintage bottles of Evan Williams uh, Wild Turkey. So we're talking from like the seventies, um, old Granddad, for instance. And what we did was we bought the the new iterations of the bottles of the brand and did a side by side because what we wanted to test was whether it was made better back then um, because I'm a big fan of Dusty's and a few of us are in the group and we kind of wanted to see if you know, there, there's an argument going that was it made better did it taste better or are we just saying that because it's a dusty bottle and we we, we you know we're expecting it to but the the result was pretty much unanimous around the room uh, where well, it was unanimous and everybody preferred du the dusties over the um uh the new versions which was interesting well i think well yeah let's let's touch let's touch on dusty hunting here in a little bit you know one thing that you guys both had in common at least uh, uh and, and probably is a common thread amongst a lot of the members of the bbs is that you know probably a lot of people will start their lives off in scotch you know i i typically i didn't right because you know coming from kentucky it was just bourbon but you know how do you how do you educate people that are coming from scotch about bourbon and saying like this is a completely different thing or like saying like you know there were bourbon barrels before there were scotch barrels like how do you how do you go and you educate those people with inside your group i my my take on it would be from so, coming from someone who's quite familiar with Scotch, um, I think the biggest thing for people to get over is the fact that not all whiskey is peaty, because I think a lot of the time people tend to associate disliking whiskey with the peaty aspect. That's what I found, so the, the real smokiness. So I've had quite a few friends who have said, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about whiskey. I'm not keen on it. I don't like it. It's too smoky. It's too peaty. But then when you actually like Andrew, I got into bourbon through Woodford Reserve. But when you get them to taste something like Woodford or something, you know, uh, like Four Roses or you know Wild Turkey, I, I quickly tend to find that they are actually quite surprised at how much they like it. Um, that, that's how. That's my general take on it. I mean, my dad wasn't particularly keen on um, bourbon, but they always say. Get a um, get a Scotch drinker uh, started off on rye, which I've always found, found quite interesting because it's like a good middle ground, um, which actually with him was true. But but anyway, I think either bourbon or rye, I think if you get something quite sweet, a real caramel bomb, people who like Scotch tend to quite like it. But don't forget, people uh, people's it's about changing people's perceptions. Like I said before, most people's perception of American whiskey, especially ones that haven't you know ventured that far into it is, is, is Jack Daniels and you know they, they might mm. not have particularly fond memories of it. I mean, they, they might do, but they might think it all tastes the same. So yeah, it's, it's like giving them things like wild turkey and four roses, like Ed said, and don't punch them in the face with a car strength bottle straight away. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah true. that's a good point. And then also, you know, you know, Scotch is definitely dominating the market right there. So I guess it's, it's kind of good to talk about, you know, what is the current state of affairs with, with bourbon in the UK right now, I mean, is it healthy? Is it is it relatively easy to find? Uh, kind of talk about that. Yes, it's it's it's, it's a mixture. Um, I'd say the the market is as it's as thriving as it's ever been. Um, you only have to look in the supermarket on the supermarket shelves nowadays, and I'm not talking, you know, the specialist whiskey shops that you expect to see, um, you know, a better selection in. You just go in your, your local supermarket and you see a whole bunch of stuff that you wouldn't have seen um, four or five years ago, or even two years ago. Um, you know, we're talking craft distilleries, we're talking, you know, uh, wild turkey. You know, it's, it, you know, there's more and more bourbon coming onto the shelves, which is great. And not yeah. at ridiculous prices, not in the supermarket. Um, yeah, it's interesting. We do get quite a good allocation, don't we, really, when you when you look at what what's available to us, especially from, you know, BTAC and Pappy. I know that's like looking at the really high end, but even down to the craft stuff like you're talking about, we do have a pretty amazing range here now. So it's continually growing, which is positive, right? I mean, that's that's kind of one thing that we've been seeing is that, you know, distilleries around here are quickly amping up, 
you know, they're, they're running on full cylinders because there is a, there is a big need that you're seeing with inside of the uh, export market. So, you know, in regards to that, you know, with the market actually growing around there, I mean, are you seeing more bars that are dedicated to bourbon or like maybe, maybe more, more cocktails related to bourbon? Like what are you seeing with, in regards of, you know, when you're going out to the pub, it's a little bit different now. I think it's, it's kind of stemmed from the, you know, the advent of a lot of American themed restaurants in the UK. I and mean, that's, that's kind of something that's been happening um, before the bourbon boom over here. Um, you know, there's been a lot of really good American themed restaurants. Where you can get decent steak, really good hamburgers and things like that. And with that goes American whiskey. And I think, you know, people have been building up collections behind the scenes. And some of these bourbon bars, you know, well, these bars in, in London and, and the north of England and you know, all over the place now have got some fantastic bottles that you wouldn't, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't expect. Um, yeah, so it's, it's fantastic to see. And that's kind of when we do our events, we tend to partner with some of these restaurants because of their bourbon selections that some you know, nobody have heard, heard of um, before. Um, and now we're kind of trying to tell people, say, hey, you should go to this bar. Look at these. They've got some, fan- they've got some willets on the shelf. They've got some old dusties. You should, you should definitely go there. So it's yeah, it's interesting. It's, uh, you're right. It's actually, just thinking about it, it is often the way it's American sort of themed kind of steak, rib kind of places, which tend to have pretty good selection of the, uh, the rye seems to be quite popular in those places, don't they? You tend to go in there and find pretty amazing stuff on the shelf, just like in Norway. I mean, yeah, I mean, popular culture as well. It's stuff like Mad Men, as you say, like the, the cocktails, there's been a lot of old fashions and Manhattans being made, you know, and invariably with that comes a, a decent selection of bourbon to go with it. Yeah, so I guess you are seeing a, a change in regards of what bartenders are serving at some of these places now compared to what you would have had three, four years ago, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And so talk about like the retail market a little bit, right? Like, is it, um, I mean, we had, we had talked about, you know, we, we talked about price gouging here, uh, on the show before, you know, kind of talk about what it is, uh, you know, over there in regards of, you know, what is allocated, what's readily available. Um, you know, is the price okay? I mean, do they, do our liquor store owners finally catching on and they know what they have now? Yes. And no. Um, well, yes and yes, but there's there's some re- retail own uh, retail stores choose not to price gouge, and others do. I mean, it's it's a choice, right? And you know what we've tend to do is support a lot of the retailers that have said, look, we'll manage our allocations, and I hate to keep on banging on about BTAC and Pappy, but we'll manage our allocations fairly. We won't just you know charge five hundred pounds, six hundred, seven hundred plus for a bottle of uh, Pappy Van Winkle, what we'll do is we'll run a raffle or we'll do something, you know, run a competition for a bottle, which gets people engaged with your store. Um, It it makes it a bit fairer. Mm. And, but not everybody does that. And as you say, you know, it's exactly the same as the US where you get some retailers that, you know, look at the secondary market and want a piece of it. I was about to say, like, when do you think that started happening or started coming online? Because, you know, you guys said you've been doing this for five, six, seven years now. So, like, when did when did you see the retail market kind of really take that shift? Well, I, I don't know what, whether you'd agree with this, Andrew, but I think we've had a massively positive impact on making sure that, you know, retailers understand that maybe it's not acceptable to put on these brand new prices. Uh, we we bang that drum pretty loud in the big group, uh, and I actually think that quite a few of them have stood up and sort of taken notice from that. I mean, again, talking about Pappy, we had a dinner with Preston Van Winkle when he was over uh, last earlier this year, I think it was, uh, and I think that they've made it quite clear to their distributors in the UK that they want their bottles sold at as close to retail as possible, um, and that's kind of filtered down to, I mean for London especially, for, to sort of two or three of the main retail shops in London. And, and 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 to be fair to them, they are, you know, selling the bottles at that price. So uh, it feels like they're trying to sort of stop that from happening from the inside. 
but like Andrew said, there's definitely still some stores which are, you know, will get hold of BTAC P and other sort of hard to find stuff like Four Roses um, single barrel limited edition, and they will sell it at a huge markup. But there are people out there with the money that will come and buy it. So what can you do? I mean, that's just the way the world goes around. I think. Exactly. There's somebody that with the money that's going to buy it. But Andrew, like, what do you think? You kind of you echo Ed's statements there. Yeah, I mean. You got to ask yourself, like, when when's it going to stop that people are going to uh, are prepared to pay that amount of money for a bottle? I mean, because it's does it just because you've got it doesn't mean it's worth it, right? I mean, I I, th- I think what the the problem is that if you Google the best bourbons in the world, what happens is Pappy Van Winkle comes up, and if you're the kind of guy that wants to, you know show off and you know have a nice collection and whatever have you met friends around to coo over your bottles then you, you you'll, you'll pay whatever um but there'll come a point where and i think it's happening already where people are getting wise to the fact that there's fan, there's other great bourbons out there there's a whole world of great bourbons and you don't have to go to the the obvious to find it absolutely you know, there's some bottles that i've had that you know I'm, I'm sure if you put them in a blind against any pappy van winkles and they they they, they beat it and probably cost a fraction of the price go on we're listening what do you think <laughs> do, you know, do you know what i really like i like rebel yell 10 yeah the uh, the, the latest one that came fantastic. out it punches well above its weight and it, you know okay it's, it's difficult to get over here i mean we've seen a few bottles but not many mm-hmm. um but it's it's yeah it's, it's 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 a great bourbon, and I think there are others out there. I like um, Blanton's. You know, just the regular stuff because you guys because you guys have a, over here. Yeah, I was gonna say you guys got a lot of stuff that we can't get over there, right? No, I've, probably not Blanton's a lot. Is the only thing. Not a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I would say the Blanton's category, right? There's there's definitely more that you can get over there. So we'll uh you know we'll maybe we'll save that for here in a little bit. You know, I kind of also talk about. Um, you know, we talk about the retail market already, and we'll just take something that is, you know, pretty, pretty basic, right? I, I don't know what's what's basic over there or easy to find, but I mean, like, how is, I mean, how do taxes uh, kind of affect the pricing versus like what you could pay here in the US? Do you think it's like 15, 20% more? Um, and in regards to that, is it still cheaper than, say, like the majority of better scotches on the market? And maybe that's another reason why it, it's so palatable to some people, maybe why it's growing in the European market. Good question. I think from what I've seen, I think we, our taxes, by the time the bottle gets to us on our shelves, it's around about 40%. I mean, it's, it's they're pretty high. So, you know, don't forget that there's a whole chain of people before it gets to our shelves that, Add margin on top of margin on top of margin, um, and that's not to that, that, that's without the customs and excise getting their taking their piece of it as well. Um, I'll give you an example: something that is just oddly expensive, and I still haven't truly worked out why because it's a bit of an anom- anomaly. But the E. H. Taylors, we get them over here, right? They're not particularly difficult to find, but you would get a bottle of the rye. What's that set you back about seventy dollars? It's about eighty something like that, yeah. It's about yeah, seventy nine ninety nine is around eighty an eighty dollar retail, yeah. Standard price over here is one hundred and twenty five pounds, which is around one hundred and forty, hundred and forty five dollars, something like that. Yeah, about that, maybe may more. Right. So maybe one hundred, uh, yeah, one hundred and fifty. Yeah. It's that's that's a, almost double, right? <laughs> so in regards to that, I mean, like, is it easier to uh, try to find other countries that don't have that sort of, cause I mean, you guys had the VAT tax, right? Like VAT taxing in, in Europe is just absolutely insane. Right. I mean, it just adds on so much extra money onto this, right? Yeah. 20% is the standard. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's where a lot of it uh, kind of comes from, but you know, I know there is, there are ways to kind of go around that, you know, especially if you're uh, importing from other countries and stuff like that. So do you all end up like trying to shop at other countries and have it shipped into you or anything like that without, you know, uh, <laughs> giving away too many of your secrets? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> we all have our secrets. We've all got, got our honey holes, wherever they may be. Right. Um, 
but yeah, we th th there are com certain countries in Europe. Um, you know, this would be no secret to anybody. But you go to Spain and Italy and places like that, and these are the places that were buying up all the bourbon when nobody gave two hoots about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think Four Roses was was like the number one drink in Italy for a while, wild turkey as well, and you can still you can still find some deals you know you can go to these tiny little towns in the middle of nowhere in italy and stumble upon like a little whiskey shop that's got you know eight year 101s from the 70s just sitting on the shelf for ridiculous prices but that's um, i think everybody's gotten onto it now and it's becoming the exception as opposed to the rule but there, there are ways around it as you say it just depends on how much work you want to put in <laughs> That, that is funny you say that because I saw somebody on uh, was one of the forums and they were everybody was uh, actually it was actually it was well, Ryan actually posted a a, a Twitter uh, sorry it was on on our Instagram feed and they were comparing against like an eighty six versus a ninety two old granddad or something like that and one of them had uh, Italian import neck label on it and uh, I think somebody commented they said did anybody in like the nineties like in Italy ever drink bourbon because it seems like you, no, no matter what, nobody, everybody's bottles all come from Italy now. It seems like for you know, old granddad or stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, it, it seems it seems that way. But I think think the only people that are still buying those bottles are us. <laughs> You're yeah, probably I've right. I bought loads from uh, Italy recently. Loads. Yeah, I mean it's it's funny, right? It's it just seemed like nobody in Italy was drinking bourbon back then, and they just had they had a bunch. So I guess uh, if anybody's planning any vacations to. Uh, <laughs> to venice you know start start mapping out your, even, your man, like most of those shelves have been cleaned out it's like you know we've we've googled to completion for for yeah. The bottles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a little bit easier for you guys to get it uh in your hands too considering it doesn't have to go over any uh well not a huge body of water i guess you could say to, to get back to you all so <laughs> it's still a risk it's still a risk buying it especially in italy because it's the Italians aren't best known for their logistics skills. <laughs> when you, by the time you get your bottle, it's, it's a big gamble as to whether it's in, you know, it becomes your, your, your new favorite jigsaw pick puzzle or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. So, um, you know, let's talk about, uh, you know, you guys had talked about, Hey, you did a, a barrel pick with, um, you know, a few a little before this, I'm sure you've done a few other ones. Um, are you guys coming to Kentucky to do those? Are you guys getting samples shipped over to you? Like, how do you all do a lot of your barrel picks? Yeah, what time do you want us over? <laughs> yeah, we're ready. <laughs> so I was about to say, are you guys making the pilgrimage to the U.S. very often for doing anything like that? This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Art Eatables, the world's first bourbon-certified chocolatier, is your best source for bourbon-inspired candy and chocolate creations. Their small batch bourbon truffle is found throughout the bourbon trail, featuring over 70 different bourbons and ryes. They make chocolates for more distillers than everyone else in the state combined. Each bourbon truffle is adorned with a chocolate token, their trademark BIT, or the BIT, that identifies the bourbon and marks it as a genuine Art Eatables creation. If you're looking to try a bourbon and chocolate pairing, this is the creme de la creme. In addition to their famous bourbon truffles that come in four, eight, 16 packs, and various sampler collections, check out their other creations such as caramels, dipped Oreos, and hand-painted chocolates. Shop their downtown Louisville locations at 631 South 4th Street and 819 West Main Street, or have them shipped to your door when the online store reopens this fall at arteatables.com. Use offer code PURSUIT to save 5% on your in-store and online orders. If you're like me, finding the perfect button-down shirt that fits right, isn't baggy, and doesn't look cheap, it's a real challenge. And I don't want the same clothes every other guy's wearing. I want to look good and stand apart without standing out. And I still need to look professional and polished for work. When I have an important meeting or just want to look my best, wearing a great-fitting, high-quality shirt makes me feel more confident. And that's why I'm glad I found out about Leadberry.com. Leadberry offers premium fabric on all their shirts, sport coats, pants, sweaters, and ties. Their customer service is more like a consultation with premium assistance where you get to talk to a real person right away. They have over a thousand five-star reviews, but really, I could go on and on. Take it from me. 
I've ordered from Leadberry, and they are really some of the best shirts that I own in my closet. Visit leadberry.com, L-E-D-B-U-R-Y.com slash bourbon today and use coupon code bourbon at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Um, are you guys coming to Kentucky to do those? Are you guys getting samples shipped over to you? Like, how do you all do a lot of your barrel picks? Yeah, what time do you want us over? <laughs> yeah, we're ready. <laughs> so I was about to say, are you guys making the pilgrimage to the U.S. very often for doing anything like that? We all want to, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was actually in the States last week, but um, I was just gallivanting around LA looking for rare bottles. But yeah, no, I, I'd love to do the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. I think um, I think Chris might be doing another one of the guys in the, who's one of the founding members. I think he's doing it uh, next year. But yeah, no, I mean, for the for the first barrel pick we did, we had samples sent over uh, and they came from Chicago because that came from a few. And we just just recently, two weeks ago, uh, did our first our first pick with a whistle pig, which is our second barrel. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how we've done it so far. We've had them sent, sent to us, but yeah, I think I think we'd all love to go over to the States and do that. That would be great. Well, I was about to say, so you were here in LA, uh, recently, you know, I, I have a few, few friends that are from Europe and, you know, being in the, the kind of tech circuit that I am in, you know, there's a lot of conferences and traveling all different places and I know that whenever they come over and fly to the U.S., they always bring extra suitcases because of how cheap everything is around here. And they just they load up on clothes, they load up on everything, right? So, uh, yeah, do you, yeah. as I say, do you all do the same? You load up on a bunch uh, of whiskey and booze and well, ship it all back, yeah. or what? <laughs> this time I did. This time I had a couple of bottles of uh, Rebel Yell ten year old shipped to uh, the production company I was working with because it was easier to buy them on BSM for a really good price and then get them shipped to to there and then i and then i went to where did i go i went to knl in uh west hollywood and i picked up some bell mead 10 year old single barrel because i'd heard lots of good stuff about that i'm mm-hmm. pretty sure that's an M- mgp um whiskey um but yeah no i mean to be honest with you, there's limits to how much you can bring back so uh, I just uh, three bottles and then a few beers was enough. That was all good. Yeah, there you go. That or you just got to put in a lot of different brown boxes and like just ship a few bottles at a time, right? So or just ask your colleagues and your friends. You know, I've done that many times. So right, yeah, nice. yeah. You like you think that our you know obsession is pretty big over here. We 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 organized a trip once. Um, this was around a year ago. We got in touch with the European Bourbon and Rye Association. And, you know, these, these were guys that have been kind of collecting whiskey in Switzerland for a um, number of years, like way before anybody cared as well. And we got in touch with them to see if, you know, they want to do some sort of collaboration with us. And the guy ended up inviting us over. So the six of us got the plane to Zurich. And we I didn't go. to stay at this guy's house. <laughs> and sounds like we're sounds like regrets are forming over there with with ed so yeah. it's crazy it's crazy this guy's this guy's bunker was it was basically it was a nuclear fallout shelter and i'm not even joking it was air controlled it had oxygen going into it and everything but it had the biggest collection of of american whiskey that i've ever seen yeah like I've, I've heard of ever before Lanelles, multiple bits of truths multiple you know, Willits, just every everything, everything. Crazy. It just seems like you have like good memories that are just flowing through you right now. And you just, yeah. <laughs> I'm just so annoyed that I didn't go on that because I remember, I remember us all having the conversation. I was like, oh, I don't know. I think I don't know. I'm not really good for money at the moment. I think I'll wait on that one. And then ever since then, it's just been this kind of photos and memories and talking about it, and I just regret it. So. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Yeah, no, it's but yeah, no, I mean, his collection is no, insane. Rubbish. Yeah. It was yeah. rubbish. Don't worry. Yeah. He didn't miss out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, to kind of bring it a little bit back on topic here, I kind of want to talk about, you know, you had mentioned before about taxes and how it has to trade hands multiple times. And there's, you know, about a 40% increase of what you see in MSRP versus, uh, you know, what you all see versus what we see here in the U.S. So, 
you know, in regards to that, you know, we had also mentioned that, you know, retailers, they can sell for what they want. So you guys are still, uh, I guess you could say victims of the three tier system of what, you know, essentially retailers, they can do whatever they want with it then, correct? Mm. Yes. Yes. But I think, you know, we're kind of lucky as well in a way in that we've, you know, we've, we've developed relationships with certain people and, you know, we we do get bottles ourselves. I won't say that we, we get lots, but we're able to source bottles ourselves um, from, a, from a few different, you know, retailers that know us and know that we're, you know, they're, they're not going to be chucked straight on a, an auction website, for instance. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of good. That's one of the perks, I guess. But and then Ed, I'll ask you a question. Uh, I mean, do you think that since, you know, one, one good thing that you guys have in Europe is that everybody loves to, you know, you can ship booze, you can have booze delivered, you can do whatever you want, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that helps level the, the playing ground in regards of what some retailers can do uh, for, you know, attracting new customers or something like that? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I think that... <sighs> You know, the internet is just super helpful, isn't it, to everyone? If you can, if you can order stuff and get it delivered to you. I mean, even Amazon in the UK has a pretty good collection of bourbon. I mean, I think we, we, we try and push people to support local retailers just because there's, there's actually throughout the UK there's a lot of, you know, small local off license uh, wine shops, uh, spirit shops that, you know, do stock pretty good amounts and good ranges. So, yeah, I think uh, you know it's. It's, I don't think it's a difficult thing to get hold of, but I mean, I just, I think we try and encourage people to go to, to local places rather than, you know, go online. I think there's enough around now for it to be easy enough to do that. Oh, that's good to know because it's, it's funny, you know, we've had people talk about it before and we say like, you know, how could this all change? Like, how could we change this if, if everybody didn't have to worry about price gouging and then we're like, well give it all to Costco or give it all to Amazon. Like whoever has the logistics of being able to do this at the, basically a race to the bottom. Right. And, and it's mm. kind of unique in that you all have the opportunity to actually buy stuff off of Amazon yet. You just, you're like, Oh, we'd rather support our local stores. Right. So I don't know. It's, well, it's, pretty interesting. Yeah. it's an interesting one though, because I think, you know, the stuff that's available on Amazon is stuff that you guys are so used to be able to walk into any shop and get. So, um, I, I think for the harder to find things, you're always going to have to go to sort of local sh stores or the whiskey exchange or Amethyst or any of those kind of well-known spirits dis distributors. But um, I think it's the point is there's some really good deals online with some of these big retailers. I mean, I don't know what the law is in the States. Can you guys, you can't buy from Amazon. So there's no whiskey on Amazon. Uh, they had yeah. recently launched wine. That was like, right. uh, I, I would say just a few months ago, they recently just watched watched that. But you know that doesn't even go to you know every fifty states. It's only the whatever the twenty yeah, or that, select that's few what that I was allows. Because I've seen, I mean, I you know, having Googled literally everything ever when it comes to whiskey, I think you tend to sort of find yourself finding bottles, and then you try and work out if you can ship them to friends in the US, and then pick them when you go on holiday, or pick them up when you go on holiday, or get them shipped over, or whatever. Uh, and I noticed that. Yeah, quite a few states you can't ship to. So I, I, I've never really understood why that is, but old, outdated like laws is what it is. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, uh, I'll kind of want to throw this as a as a kind of a question to you all too, because you know we we talked about taxes, and there's been there was some news. Uh, it was a, it was a few months ago, so it was actually. Uh, back in July, you know, at this point, Trump is kind of making more enemies across the globe and, you know, within our own country, it seems like every single day. And the European Union had talked about a kind of a retaliatory tariff on what was going to be the steel imports. And so they said that they were going to do heavy taxes on American whiskey. And of course, this was uh, hopefully maybe it was aimed at the Senate majority leader, which is Mitch McConnell, who actually represents Kentucky. So it's no wonder that they would do this and kind of just go straight for the groin. But as the bourbon boom kind of really begins and flourish in these export markets, this may take a make take a hit because as we had mentioned earlier, you know, every distillery around here is and is in hyper growth phase. They are dumping millions and millions of dollars into investing in their distillery, bigging, you know, building more stills, building more uh, you know, mash tubs, everything that they can get to get more proof gallons out per day. Uh, we just had somebody on recently that was going from 30 gallons to 130 gallons in the span of a year. So I kind of want to get your idea, um, and not only this is 
you know, Fred Minnick actually published this article. Uh, it was on the New York Times, uh, like I said, back in July, and really dove deeper in the subject on, you know, he thinks that, you know, Trump could kill the bourbon boom because it's just going to make the the prices over in the UK and over in Europe just astronomical. So kind of want to get your opinions on on this and if, if you've been paying any attention to it as well. Well, if this is something that's, uh, you know, th- going to affect Europe, it, this might actually be a positive to not being in Europe for us. <laughs> sure, <laughs> with Brexit, you know, right? Yeah. The bourbon reaches our shores and, you know, doesn't make it to Europe. Um, but no, it's, it's a bad thing, of course, if if it just makes it um, financially unfeasible to send any bottles and purchase any bottles over here or, and, or the ones that do are just so overpriced that nobody buys them, then we're going into a, a potentially another glut era. Mm. Um, I can't see that which, happening. Yeah. yeah. You know, which is potentially again good for uh, good for a few people but not good for the industry mm. um you know we're Trump's kind of huge on a golden age and i, I want Trump's to see huge on local infrastructure isn't he yeah. so i don't think he's going to allow a situation where you've got all these you know distillers pumping out millions of gallons of bourbon and unable to sell it that's a catastrophe so i think uh you know let's fast forward a few years down the line if he if if you know, you need that export. So um, I can't, I don't know. I think it's all just, uh, it's all just hype, hype and rhetoric, just trying to make a, you know, a story really. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, um, you know, I think it has some validity to it, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a power play, right? I mean, like we're all, we're definitely below the, the government regulations of who's going to do what and whatnot. Um, but you know, it was, it was something that, you know, I think, uh, it was news for, for a little bit on what people really cared about. But like I said, I just kind of want to see what your all's opinion uh, about that as well. Um, you know, one thing I didn't really ask is, uh, you know, I know you guys are very centrally, uh, you know, focused on London and the UK, but you know, what have you seen in regards to bourbon, uh, out, you know, outside of your country, uh, if you're doing any travels and you know, you had mentioned going to Zurich, um, any other countries that you've seen, maybe some of the sort of the spike and rise, uh, just talking, you know, just within, the growth there. I would say, in terms of bourbon growth, I honestly, aside from the UK, I haven't seen bourbon as uh, growing as 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 fast as it is over, uh, you know, as it has been over here. Um, that may be also Australia part because I don't know where to go. But there is a, there's a few bars. I mean, Ed, what do you what do you think? Yeah. Um... I'd agree. I mean, I don't know too much. I mean, I guess I know France is a big whiskey drinking com- uh, country. Um, I imagine bourbon's pretty popular there. It seems like no one in Italy wants bourbon because we're buying it all. Um, <laughs> um, but but then, the Chianti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't publish that. Don't publish. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, um, Australia, I think. I was in Australia in February. Uh, I know that's not Europe, but I, I was quite surprised at how high the prices were there. I remember thinking, I mean, obviously it's, it's you know, as far away from any, anywhere as you can get. So, but, but they were big prices, you know, much more than, I mean, their secondary prices were high. So, um, yeah, that's one place, I guess. But then in Europe, I think Germany maybe, but again, I haven't been to those places enough. Netherlands, yeah. Yeah, ne- I think Netherlands has got a pretty um, decent whiskey, uh, American whiskey scene. Absolutely. You know, they've got some pretty good online shops as well. Well, that's cool. So another thing, you know, you talked about, you mentioned Australia, um, Ed, it's, it's kind of Mm -hmm. funny. We always say we have a few people that follow us from Australia and honestly, it's the only time I've ever seen it because they've, they've sent pictures and they're like, Oh yeah, starting my dad with some bourbon and Coke. And it's literally a can with bourbon and Coke, like pre-mixed. Like you can just go to the supermarket and buy this stuff. I was, I was amazed. (laughs) We have that over here. Do you really? Okay, I had no idea. I thought it was just like an Australian thing. No, no, no. It's um, JD do them, Jim Beam do them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's quite funny actually. I just remembered now. So earlier in the year, one of the other uh, sort of members of the group had posted up a picture of himself uh, in Sydney picking up a Sazerac 18 uh, 2015 bottle um, in a shop in, in Sydney. And he said, there's one more here, you know, if anyone's going to be over gave the name of the store and stuff and I called up and I said look I'm going to be there in six weeks time can you can you hold the bottle for me and he said well look I can't hold the bottle but um you know 
I'll put it aside and then if someone comes in and wants it, I'll sell it to them. I went back six weeks later and it was still there. And I think I paid £250 or something for it. So I was quite amazed at that because every other store I went into and I saw those type of bottles, they were astronomically expensive. So um, still some gems out there, but it was but pricey. Yeah, it's, that's interesting. I mean, it's it's definitely interesting that, you know, you're able to do that. So kind of talk about, you know, the antique collection and, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned that you get a decent allocation there, but kind of talk like what it is, like just hunting, like what's like bourbon hunting over there. And because the fact is that, you know, you start off with six and you've grown the beast to 1200. So now you have a lot more people that you have to uh, pay, you know, pound <laughs> the streets with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a lot, a lot harder, a lot harder. Um, I wrote a blog piece uh, about a year or so ago. It was a three-parter about my mission to complete the BTEC antique collection. I think this was this was 2015 collection, and it was actually because it was such a mission. It was a pretty pretty funny experience. It was you know me running around London, um, various different shops, getting calls, you know, getting messages on Twitter. Hey, there's there's a bottle at this shop. You got to go get in the train. Just madness i think doing that now i mean i don't think it'd even bother mm. if, if you're not by that shop now right that second you're not going to get it um there's a a guy recently went in to get a bottle of pappy van winkle dressed as a cowboy because that was the that was the condition that the store owner put on uh purchasing this bottle of pappy 15 <laughs> The, oh man! It, I, I hope somebody can to just listen to this and take that as a take that as a cue. That's hilarious. Yeah. It's quite funny because um, there, there's the distribution of um, BTAC and Pappy is handled by the same company in the UK, and um, they're they're predominantly an on trade company. So that, that they want to make sure that as many of these bottles are in bars and are being drunk by people at reasonable prices as possible, which is really good. But it just obviously means there's a lot less at retail. So what? What they do now, which they didn't last year, last year what they used to do is, they, you know, shortly after these bottles get released in, you know, around October, November, your time, we would see them in December, January, February, and then they would just dump onto the market and then everyone would go mad for them and they'd run and buy them. Now what they're doing is they're drip feeding them out over the year, um, which is much better because it obviously gives more people an opportunity to get hold of the bottles. Um, but actually, I mean, if you think about this last year, Andrew, I mean, they've been around and actually not too difficult to get hold of if you keep your ear to the ground than they were last year, just because of that drip feeding your product through. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's an interesting, you know, strategy for sure. I think, um, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I think Andrew brought up a pretty funny point, right? Because around here, and not around here, but in the U.S. in general, maybe not in some of the major metro areas, but you know, like truck chasing is a very like real thing where people get in their car and they will chase the delivery truck from store to store to store, go in, see what they can do. If not follow the truck to the next door, so on and so forth. But wow. you, know, you just said, you just said like, I got to hop on the train, right? Like it's kind of a more difficult thing, you know, especially around there that you, you don't necessarily, I mean, I don't know if you guys have cars or not, cause I know it's a super congested city, but you know, you're not really like hopping an Uber or hopping in one of the taxis or anything like that to go. That has that. happened. Oh yeah, happened to. Yeah, that definitely happens. I was just going to try and find a photo actually because I think you might find this quite funny because the the store that Andrew was talking about, what they do is they 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 put um, they put tweets out basically, and their tweet will say something like you know brand new vodka in store, and it will have a picture of a really basic bottle of vodka, and then in the background they'll have like a couple of old Rip Van Winkle boxes. In, in the you know in the background or they'll have like a Weller 12 on its side and uh, unless you're paying attention it's really easy to miss um, but that's how they kind of say we've got some in stock and it's basically first come first serve so he has a bit of fun with people and then he did the say he did the thing with the cowboy where he was like look I've got a pa was it a Pappy 23 or a Pappy 20 and he was like uh, it was a 15 I think it was a 15 and he said look basically the next person to come in here dressed as a cowboy you know can buy it for uh, retail uh, he always sells at retail anyway. And then now he's doing this thing at the moment where he's making people buy a um, like a can of Coke with their with their with their Pappy or their BTAC. So it's like mandatory. If you come in and you want to buy a bottle of Old Rip 10, you have to buy a Diet Coke as well for 99p. 
uh, it's a bit of a jibe at another store that was with pairing bottles for a long time. They were doing this thing where if you came into store and you wanted to buy an expensive bottle, you had to buy another bottle with it at a ridiculous price. So he's just poking fun at them, basically. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. That is. That's, that's a that's a pretty interesting take. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure. So I mean, I got all kinds of Halloween decorations and uh, you know outfits in the basement. Like I will, I will, I will not be scared to dress up as a sriracha bottle to go <laughs> to go and buy a bottle somewhere. So. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, a couple of years ago, I said, you know, we, we hear, hear about, you know, people queuing outside of liquor stores in the US. And a couple of years ago, I thought, geez, you, you got to be mental to do that. I did that for the first time this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the club. I, I thought, what's so good about That's that? That's one of those photos. Is that I was one of only three people in the line. <laughs> well, that's that makes it really easy if you're only one of three. Yeah, yeah exactly. 33% chance at a raffle or 33% chance at a first come, first serve? First come, first serve. See, that's yeah. that's what I love, right? So as long as you're, long as you're able to make it, I think uh, the riches go to the spoils. It's still worth doing. If you can put your pride somewhere else, leave that at home and your dignity somewhere else, then, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you it's, it. it's funny. I got a few people that, you know, we go and do this stuff with and um, – and they were like, I'm not going to go and wait in line if there's people that I know there. Like, I'm not going to I'm not going to be that person. But mm. I have no shame. So uh, I'll, I'll wear my Bourbon Pursuit T-shirt out there. And hopefully people will like it is actually funny. We, we I had to do this recently. And uh, and they were like, I thought they just sent you these bottles for free. I'm like, no, no, there's you no know, these distilleries aren't sending me anything for free. So I got to yeah. I got to pound the pavement just like everyone else here. So. Yeah. So the uh, the other thing, uh, kind of just a random question, just to kind of throw at you guys to kind of get your, uh, you know, your gauge of, of really like what you like to drink. You know, around you all, you know, you do have some things that uh, aren't necessarily available in the in the U.S. because it is a European market. And, you know, I don't know why Blanton straight from the barrel, Blanton's Gold, and Blanton Special Reserve cannot be sold within the U.S. I don't know why. I've heard multiple different things of. Well, the distributor owns the the rights to it, and they won't let it sell. I've heard people say, "Well, the U.S. market just couldn't handle you know that much barrel strength. They just they just couldn't keep up with it because they can't even have they can't keep the regular blends in stock." Uh, you had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you guys still have uh, you know age dated wild turkey that you can still get on like Masters and Malt and Whiskey Exchange and stuff like that. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you all have that. Uh, can be relatively valued from a, a, an export market. Maybe not just the special stuff, but everyday good stuff that is uh, available for you to find. So I guess for you, a question for you all, um, you know, what do you wish that we had in the U.S. that you had everyday access to? What do I wish that you had in the U.S. Mm. that we've got everyday access to? What do, you, what do you wish that you had everyday access to that we only oh, have in the U.S.? Right. right. Um, good question. Um. Because I mean, yeah, I can, I can, I can see behind you store picks. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, I guess that's, that's that's a really good question. I kind of want to talk about that. I mean, talk about. I mean, so there's nothing that that kind of exists around you for that sort of stuff. No, right. I'll, I'll give an example. Smooth, smooth Ambler have done two picks um, in the UK. One of them for Jerry's. One of them for a a bar which you can't, you, you know, you can only go drink it. If you go and drink at the bar, you can't buy the bottles. Um, Four Roses have never done one. Um, Buffalo Trace have never d uh, have done Eagle Rare picks, I think, but they only do them for bars. They don't do them for stores. So, again, you can only get them if you mm. go and drink in the bars. Um, so it's, it's difficult to buy, you know, buy them off the shelf. Whistle Pig have done one. We will be the, the second barrel pick that they've ever done in the UK. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see more of it and hopefully what we're doing, you know, hopefully we, 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 we're going to be able to, but I'd like to see more of that. Like, I'm, thinking, I'm, I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's definitely an interesting thing. I mean, cause you know, around here, like it's a, I mean, they're a dime a dozen, right? So like there, you can find them, you know, of course some are good, some are great, some aren't as great, but there's hardly ever any that are like just terrible. So, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty interesting thing that, you know, you think that, you know, really store picks is something that you wish you had access to. You know, I, I figured you were to say something like, uh, you know, like Weller 107 or something like that, right? Where, granted, it's not always available, but it's, it's much more readily available. But I think uh, I think that's a really good answer with store picks because, uh, you know, I, I with, with how big everything's getting, I mean, it's all based upon 
the amount you sell. And maybe it's just the stores need to be a little bit more pushy with their distributors to see if they can get in line for it or something. I, I'm not too sure how those rules actually work. Mm. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe because they've got to buy all of the bottles at once. You know, they've got to purchase every single bottle of the barrel, and then it's, it's maybe it's a bit too much of a financial risk to take at once. I don't know. I, I was just having a quick scroll through K and L just to see if anything sort of jogged my memory. But I think one one bottle that I was, well, I'm a bit annoyed hasn't made its way over here yet was the Rebel Yell Ten Year Old, which was why I bought some when I was in the states because I just thought. Uh, when I tried that last year, it was so good, um, and for the price as well. Um, so there's 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 sometimes releases like that. Sometimes the high west stuff's harder to get, like the Yippie Kaye things like that weren't weren't easy bottles to get hold of. I don't even think anyone was distributing that over here. So yeah, store picks though is a is a good one, and also um, I tell you what, gift shop only bottles um, are even harder for us to get. So like you know the new Willet Eightieth things like that would likely never going to see them so uh or if we do we'll have to buy them on secondary so yeah but everything else you know i was just looking through that list just to see jog my memory most of that other stuff we can get well so you're spoiled anyway so i don't feel bad for you no, i'm it. just kidding <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding uh but you know i, I think that's going to wrap it up so I, you know you know andrew and ed i want to say thank you again for coming on the show today to talk about the export market some of the things that you're seeing um, you know, kind of the how things have been building and stuff like that. So before we sign off, I want to let you, uh, whoever wants to take it, give a plug for the uh, British Bourbon Society about where you can find more information about joining it and, uh, you know, kind of where they can be on the lookout for the next events coming up and stuff like that. Yeah, www.britishbourbonsociety.com. Uh, you can find out pretty much everything you need to know about British Bourbon Society on there. Uh, we've got reviews, uh, blog posts, um, information about events we've put on uh, and then that will also take you through to our Facebook page if you want to uh, you know join the group uh, or see the sort of conversations that we're having uh, but yeah the website will take you to all the places you need to go and you just got to tell everybody that's joining to say like don't go on the Pappy and BTAC hunt like save that for the, yeah. the old timers <laughs> here like <laughs> yeah like, um, like you be like, we're, we'll, we'll get you through the gradual progression, right? We'll get you through the, you know, the 80, 90 proof, then we'll get you to the barrel proof, and then we'll let you start hunting this stuff. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so thank you again, guys. I appreciate it. You know, if you make sure you also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at, at Bourbon Pursuit, make sure you support the show on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And if you have any more show suggestions, things you'd like to see, people would like to talk about, uh, other cool subjects, you know, the export market, that was a really great subject. And, you know, thankfully you're able to find two guys that are in the know that, you know, started this a long time ago. And I uh, want to say thanks to, uh, for everybody that suggested that. And, you know, uh, yeah, that's awesome. So send us an email, the duo, T-H-E-D-U-O at bourbonpursuit.com. And with that, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>